your monthly dose of astronomy news and views. This is Awesome Astronomy. Hello and welcome to episode 16 of Awesome Astronomy. I'm your host, this month's ground control, Paul. The circuits certainly aren't dead in this tin can of ours and we have an episode packed with interstellar spaceships, sun rays and comets, dead stars and the question, can you walk on a star? And if that wasn't enough, we have an interview with Herschel Space Telescope scientist and Sky at Night presenter Dr Chris North. Now joining me on this space oddity through the cosmos, fresh from taking his protein pill, is our very own Major Ralph. Hello. You know Major Tom was actually Yeah, a... yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll skip over that. It's a song about space. Commander Hadfield said so. Um, we have a packed show this month, though, don't we? Yeah, we've got some great questions for our Q&A later on, and the news this month has a really historic moment to talk about. Mm. So, Ralph, how did the September skies treat you? Well, we had an amazing weekend in Wales that we shared with some brilliant astronomers, both professional and amateur at the Astro Camp that we run, and incredibly, we had two nights with clear enough skies to really take advantage of how dark it was. Yeah, and having the BBC Sky at Night team join us to film the event topped off a great weekend. Um, discussing cosmology with Chris Lintot, the solar cycles with Lucy Green, and observing with Pete Lawrence and the Astro Camp regular Chris North. Left everyone feeling very happy. Yeah, and it was good to see Jane again, the lovely producer of the programme who worked so hard to make the Sky at Night such a joy to watch. But I did find it difficult to give away the scope prize in the oh, Astronomy yeah, Pub yeah. Quiz this time because I'd have happily taken them away <laughs> for myself. <laughs> that was a brilliant prize, yeah, me too. But we also had a captured Earthling giving great solar and lunar imaging work shops which went over a storm so we'll have to crack the whip again to get those back at the next astro camp and we had astrophysics student and friend of ours jen millard giving a fabulous talk on exoplanets oh, yeah that was life good. on yeah. earth and the possibilities for life elsewhere in the solar system yeah that provoked quite a discussion afterwards um, as did the views through her scope oh yeah we had great naked eye views of the double cluster and andromeda but through the scopes they just came alive again i'm gonna have to say that m13 stole the show for me along with views of the ice giants mm. uranus and neptune Especially in the large Smith Cassegrain scopes and the 7-inch APM refractor that oh. <laughs> took the prize of King of Scopes this time. Oh, that was an immense scope. Um, and speaking of prizes, we had cakes. Oh, yeah, they were incredible. People put so much effort into those cakes. One had the planets and a space shuttle on top made out of ice in, and those mooncake muffins were just gorgeous. So how long did it take Chris Lintot to agree to judge the cake competition? As it was less than a second. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'll um, do that. <laughs> And then following Astrocamp with the Big Street Irregular Astronomers meeting in London with clear skies overhead yet again, September's been absolutely perfect. It's been brilliant. And we had some increased meteor activity. That was un mm. unexpected. Yeah. We, uh, through the camp, there was uh, we weren't quite sure what it was. And there were a few people around the country reporting it. Um, a theory that it's the Pisiads were, were providing more meteors than normal. Yeah, and I know you thought that we had the, the usual zenithal hourly rate for the Perseids the, uh, the mm. month before last month, but I, I actually thought that we got a higher rate there as well. Yeah, so it was certainly... If certainly a good shower in the summer, and I think, but well, I don't think they were they were Perseids in September, mm. but there was certainly there was more meteor activity than lots of people were expecting. Yeah, so we're getting a good show this year from meteor showers. Mm. This is awesome astronomy. Well, that was September. Now it's time to look at what the universe has in store for us in October with our monthly sky guide. October. We have passed the autumn equinox and the long dark nights are definitely in the ascendancy. If the weather behaves, then we're in for a treat this month. We have planets putting on a show, two decent meteor showers, a lunar eclipse and a range of great DSOs to enjoy. Let's start with those planets. And the first to mention is Herschel's planet Uranus. The ice giant is currently sitting in Pisces and in a dark sky should be naked eye visible at around magnitude 5.72. It's below star Delta Pisces and reasonably easy to locate. It's in opposition on October 3rd, so it's as close as it will be this year, and while you need a big scope to see anything bigger than a grey-blue-green disc, it is certainly worth a look. Here is a planet that was only discovered in 1789, and we still know very little about it, only Voyager 2 having passed by quickly in 1986. Of Uranus's 27 known moons, four are typically visible in amateur telescopes over a minimum of about 8 inches. Ariel, Umbriel, Titania and Oberon. For those with time, patience, good eyes and imaging kits, a fifth... Miranda can sometimes be found. Don't hold your breath though, the moons are elusive and you may have to satisfy yourself with just the planet. Neptune shouldn't be overlooked, and while not a naked eye object, we're still not very far past opposition, which was at the end of August. So if you want to grab a glimpse of the furthest planet, then have a look in the constellation Aquarius, not far from the star Ansha. Neptune will be sitting between the stars Epsilon and Delta Aquarii. Moving on to Mercury, which reaches its greatest eastern elongation on October the 9th. It will be a difficult observation at sunset as this elongation is measured on the ecliptic and while this elongation is a degree longer than the one in June, the ecliptic will be low to the horizon this time round. Mercury will be mag 0.2 and is a tiny object to locate but it's amazing how many people have never seen mm. it. 
Venus is not far behind Mercury in the sky and is between Libra and Scorpius. Again, like Mercury, it is low to the horizon at sunset, but is blazing away at minus 4.11, so should be easy to locate. And on the evening of the 8th, it will share the sky with a slim crescent moon, which should make for a wonderful sight just after sunset. The morning skies are giving us a glimpse of the winter to come, and blazing away in Gemini is, of course, the returning king, Jupiter. Gemini pops over the horizon at latitude 51 around midnight at the beginning of the month, and as early as 8.30, 9 o'clock, universal time by the month's end. At magnitude minus 2.4, Jupiter is unmistakable, and of course, even binoculars or a small scope will reveal the Galilean moons. And scopes above 3 inches will start to show details on the planetary disk. Opposition for Jupiter is still many months away, so we have a long Jupiter season ahead, and with an impressive 60 degrees of altitude being achieved, the king is really going to be looking down on us this winter. Following on behind, and still skulking in the pre-dawn sky, is Mars, which is still a very long way from its best. That said, it is providing other opportunities, and while last month it passed through the beehive cluster in Cancer, this month the star Regulus in Leo gets the red planet treatment, with Mars passing close between the 10th and 20th, with closest conjunction on the 15th and 16th. This should be a good chance to improve your knowledge of magnitude, as both will be of very similar brightness, Mars at 1.56 and Regulus at 1.35. The Moon presents us with an eclipse this month, though it's not a full one, rather a penumbral eclipse. Now this is due to the Earth's shadow and the Moon's orbit being more complex beasts than it first appears. The Moon's orbit is elliptical and is inclined at a little over 5 degrees, while the shadow the Earth projects into space has two major parts the Moon can pass through. The umbra, Latin for shadow, is the cone of shadow projecting behind the Earth away from the Sun, and this causes partial and total eclipses. The area around the umbra is the penumbra, or almost shadow, and this creates eclipses where the moon darkens or reddens rather than vanishing. This penumbral eclipse will occur at full moon on the 18th and be visible across much of the world except the Pacific region and Australasia. Sorry about that. It will begin at 2150 Universal Time and will end at 149 Universal Time. New moon is on October the 5th. We have a couple of nice meteor showers in October to look forward to, with the Draconids resulting from Comet 21P Giacobini Zinner in the early part of the month, peaking on the 7th and 8th of October. This is a small shower but can produce sudden unexpected bursts, and with such a high radiance is one of the showers that is better in the first half of the night. Towards the end of the month we have the Orionids, which peaks on the night of the 21st and 22nd. Now this is a bigger shower than the Draconids, and is the second meteor shower from Comet Halley, the other being the Atua Quirids in early May. Now, while the Orionids are a bigger shower, the moon is badly placed for the peak, and it may be that those of you out there needing a meteor fix will have better luck with the smaller draconids that occur nearer the new moon. Deep sky astronomy this month is still dominated by constellations such as Pegasus, Andromeda and Cassiopeia, which we covered last month, but following behind and becoming nicely placed for observation as the month progresses are Perseus, Camelopardalis and Auriga. Perseus is a slightly indistinct constellation to the east of Cassiopeia, but contains some real treasures, such as the open cluster M34, NGC 869 and 884, the famous double cluster, and M76, the little dumbbell planetary nebula, famously one of the hardest of the Messier to see, and interestingly is thought to be what M57, the ring nebula, would look like if you'd side on. It's also worth mentioning NGC 1499, the California Emission Nebula, a very difficult low surface brightness target. Camelopardalis, or the giraffe, is one of the constellations astronomers wave at and say, it's over there. It contains several galaxies that can be seen in larger amateur scopes, such as NGC 2403, a William Herschel discovery and part of the M81 group. The highlight of Camelopardus, to use the older spelling, has to be the Kemble Cascade, a line of stars that ends in a splash pool of open cluster NGC 1502, a great small scope and binocular sight. Auriga, the charioteer, is a far more obvious constellation, signposted by Capella, the sixth brightest star in the sky. Here you'll find three beautiful open clusters, M36, 37 and 38. You'll also be able to find IC405, the flaming star nebula, which is lit up by star AE Auriga. This star is interesting because it's not thought to originate in the nebula, but is a runaway interloper and actually started life in M42, the Orion nebula. So, good luck with the October skies, and remember to wrap up warm. So, what are your plans for October observing, Ralph? Well, I definitely want to take a look at Kemble's Cascade. It's a star cluster in alignment that I'm ashamed to say I haven't yet seen. And I want to see how far I can push city astrophotography using light pollution filters on the Andromeda galaxy now that it's rising high in the east. So I think that's going to keep me busy for a while. Nice. I think I'm certainly going to take in the eclipse. Um, and mm. Uranus is my favourite planet. I can't see much, but that doesn't matter. I'm a bit of a cluster addict as well. So Auriga is high on my target list. This is awesome astronomy. Okay, that's the skies this month. Let's see what's hitting the news in the world of space and astronomy. Ralph. 
Well, the big news this month is one that's so big that it's not only been confined to the pages of astronomy websites or magazines like most astronomy news stories are, but actually made it into national tabloid and broadsheet newspapers. And that's the interpretation of NASA's Voyager team that the venerable Voyager 1 spacecraft has indeed finally left our solar system and entered interstellar space. In fact, crunching the numbers, it most likely left our solar system on the 25th of August last year. Yay! And the reason for this uncertainty is largely because a plasma detector that both Voyager spacecraft were launched with stopped functioning on Voyager 1 in 1980, and that would have given us greater insight into the flow of solar wind and galactic particles that are basically counted up to determine whether the craft is within the magnetic reach of our Sun or the wider Milky Way. So if we jump all the way back to 1977, the year that Uranus's rings were discovered and the year that Elvis died, the two Voyager spacecraft were launched just 16 days apart from one another. They were identical spacecraft with identical instruments to take advantage of a rare planetary alignment that meant that they could visit all the outer planets in the solar system in sequence, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. Now, Pluto didn't get visited because Saturn's moon Titan looked like a far more interesting target for Voyager 1, and getting there ruled out an onward trajectory to the now dwarf planet. Similarly, Voyager 2 flew past Uranus and Neptune, and the trajectory for Pluto would have required the spacecraft to actually fly through Neptune. (laughs) So Pluto now has to wait until 2015 when the New Horizon spacecraft gets there. So while studies of the Jovian and Saturnian systems were the Voyager's main goals, It was known that if the instrumentation survived numerous decades in deep space, they would eventually leave the solar system and should be able to reveal what interstellar space is like. But until they do make their way out of the solar system, every model and simulation on the conditions there is pretty much based on the Earth orbiting Ibex satellite and a whole heap of educated guesswork. No human or piece of human engineering has ever left the solar system and travelling for 36 years at its current speed of 39,000 miles an hour Voyager 1 appears to have finally become mankind's first and only interstellar emissary. Yeah, it was only last year that NASA gave a conference about Voyager 1's position, and it was all about magnetic field lines, magnetic highways, but we seem to be back to good old particles and plasma again. Yeah, for all the right reasons, NASA were cautious about their findings last year, and the magnetic highway that they revealed as being another onion layer to the boundary of the solar system appears to have actually been the conditions outside the solar system after all, and the magnetic highway either exists in galactic space or it was just a misinterpretation of what they were actually seeing. Uh, So kind of like Einstein's cosmological constant. Yeah, that's a very good analogy, because feeling that the instrument readings didn't point to a clear boundary crossover for Voyager, the NASA team, if you like, invented this magnetic highway to fit what they were seeing. But as we mentioned in last month's show, the magnetic fields were probably a red herring and plasma density readings seemed to be casting the deciding vote on this. Now in April of this year, a coronal mass ejection from our sun caused the interstellar plasma surrounding Voyager to oscillate wildly and presented the instruments with a 50-fold spike in charged and neutral particles. Oscillations different to those seen inside the heliosphere, or the sun's realm, our solar system. And combined with plasma vibrations detected by Voyager in October last year, this points overwhelmingly to galactic cosmic rays from distant supernovas and neighbouring stars. And you can hear how that sounds when the oscillations are converted into audio as two blips, one faint one from October and a louder one from April. Now, the researchers who published their work in the journal Science this month looked at that April peak of 0.08 particles per cubic metre during this coronal mass ejection of a known intensity and calculated that the standard particle rate without the CME would have been 0.002 particles per cubic metre. And that's very close to the predicted particle rate of interstellar space. And without this serendipitous CME, we couldn't have such confidence and would still be thinking Voyager 1 was in a region of our solar system that in all likelihood doesn't exist. So to return to your early Elvis reference, can we say conclusively that Voyager 1 has left the building? Well, no. There's still the possibility that this is a buffeting of solar particles and galactic particles on the edge of interstellar space, but still just inside the solar system. Or it could be Voyager sailing through bubbles of increased plasma density. But it seems more likely that it has made this historic transition into the Greater Milky Way, and we feel confident now saying that it has. But this is where the tardy Voyager 2 gets to steal the limelight once again, because although it took a different trajectory to Voyager 1 after it left Saturn, and it's only travelled 9 billion miles... Only 9 billion. (laughs) Yeah, well, only 9 billion compared to Voyager 1's almost 12 billion miles. Voyager 2 has a better functioning plasma detector and should 
corroborate Voyager 1's finding with greater precision when it reaches the same distance around about 2018. Now, in all the excitement of announcing that Voyager 1's left the solar system, it seemed all the newspapers and websites forgot to actually tell us where interstellar space begins. So how far do we have to travel to leave the solar system? Okay, so if you want to build your own ship to explore interstellar space yourself, you're going to have to travel 11,317,000,000 miles, or 121.5 times further than the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And this is historic. Not only because the spacecraft survived decades in unforgiving conditions with 1970s technology, but because, like the ships that first set sail to explore the oceans, or Sputnik 1 being the first orbiting craft, or Luna 2 putting the first man-made object on the moon, this is our first steps into a new era of human understanding. But this time, it's outside the solar system, which is so unimaginably distant that if you could drive there at a constant 70 miles an hour, it would take you 18 and a half thousand years to get there. And we can be thankful for the foresight and effort of the NASA teams that took advantage of that rare planetary alignment that won't happen again until 2153. OK, so you're moving back into the solar system for the next news item and a return to the moon. Yes. Well, with Mars rovers and interstellar voyages, it's easy to forget that there's still a lot of research going on into the moon and there's a lot that we still don't know about the moon. And there's nobody doing more research at the moment into the moon than NASA, who launched the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, to take high-resolution images of the lunar surface four years ago. They deorbited the Grail Lunar Gravity Mapping spacecraft in December last year and launched the LADI mission just last month on the 6th of September for its 100-day science mission. And LADI, which stands for Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer, is taking a leisurely 30-day orbital path to the moon in order to gather detailed information about the lunar atmosphere, conditions near the surface, and environmental influences on lunar dust. But it's going to do a lot more than that implies, because LADI will be looking for the gaseous concentrations of argon, helium, sodium, and other traces that make up the 1 million molecules per cubic centimetre exosphere around the moon using its ultraviolet and visible light spectrometer. And if 1 million molecules per cubic centimetre sounds like a lot, just compare that to the Earth's atmosphere of 10 quintillion, or 10 billion billion molecules per cubic centimetre, and it's apparent that its instruments have to be incredibly sensitive while orbiting more than 20 kilometres above the moon's surface. And the next instrument it carries is the neutral mass spectrometer to measure the change in abundances in this exosphere on different orbits and in different conditions, like light and dark phases and in between the mountains and the seas, to see how much the exosphere changes over time and geographically. Then finally it has the lunar dust experiment and apart from measuring the dust characteristics in the atmosphere and allowing scientists to better engineer future spacesuits and tools that won't get clogged up by lunar dust, it'll also attempt to solve a long-standing mystery because the Apollo astronauts reported seeing a glow on the horizon just before the lunar dawn and it's thought that this was caused by the sun's ultraviolet light electrically charging dust in the atmosphere and causing it to glow. So hopefully Laddie will give us some closure on that too. But it also has scientific value for other bodies in the solar system because thick atmospheres like we see on Venus, Titan, Earth and Uranus, for example, are the rarities. There are far more bodies in the solar system that have these exospheres or tenuous atmospheres. Mercury, most moons, asteroids and possibly even Kuiper Belt objects. So Laddie should allow us to better model these objects and learn more about their environments without even visiting them. But apart from the science, I think the technology demonstrations on this rather cheap mission by NASA standards show the really smart direction that NASA are going in with, with regard to advancing space technology. Yeah, this spacecraft itself sees a new approach in spacecraft design where NASA wants to do cheaper missions with the same quality science expectations by making spacecraft design and build cheaper. And it's surprising they hadn't really latched onto this idea before now, but what they have is called a modular common spacecraft bus. And to you and me, that means moving away from bespoke spacecraft chassis each time they build a new mission in favour of production line building spacecraft the same way each time and then slotting instruments into it and adding different extra modules when needed. So for instance they'll add legs on landers or extra capacity modules for long duration missions and they see this assembly line production reaping huge savings in future and describe it as analogous to the Model T Ford production economies. And then there's a, a very cool new communications proof of concept on board called the Lunar Laser Communications Demonstration or LLCD. And LLCD will trial laser communications transmitted through an infrared laser, which will have a far greater bandwidth and therefore greater transfer rates than current radio transmissions allow. 
Now, this also means large dishes aren't needed for receiving the signals. Now, because lasers have always been very power-hungry, they haven't been used on spacecraft beyond close Earth orbits, but lasers are becoming far more power-efficient, and NASA feels it's time to trial them for communications. Yeah, and I think Don Cornwall from NASA Goddard said it was like transitioning from dial-up to broadband in space. Yeah, and just think about what that opens up. NASA's, what, 99.9% about science and technology and 0.1% about publicity. But it's that 0.1% that allows the public to see the almost $17 billion a year they spend on science and tech as money well spent. And what's better publicity than seeing Earth rise over the moon or Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons, venting water into Saturn's rings? Or the high-resolution image of a Martian stream bed. Exactly, and it was only last year that we were getting really excited looking on the NASA JPL website for the latest Curiosity rover image downloads from Mars. And we were marvelling that we were getting hundreds of new images every day. Well, if this communication demonstration goes well, we can expect live HD video on future manned and robotic missions. And just think what that'll be like, live HD streaming of future rovers, helmet cameras when humans return to the moon or tether themselves to asteroids next decade, even live HD streaming of robots landing and then exploring to look for life on Jupiter's or Saturn's moons in the not-too-distant future. Fantastic. Now you've got news about a fabulous site that we won't have long to wait for. Yes, who's excited about Comet Eyes on? Oh, me, me, me. Who's read too many stories about it being the Comet of the Century and is getting glum because of more recent articles about what a damp squib it's going to be? Me. Well, from the initial wave of optimism to the pessimistic naysaying of astronomy journalists, we finally have some real research about Eyes on, and it should lift our spirits once again. And this research comes from Matthew Knight of the Lowell Observatory and Kevin Walsh of the Southwest Research Institute in the US via a paper submitted to the Astrophysical Journal last month. And these researchers compared what's known about the size and trajectory of Comet Eisen with a class of more commonly observed comets known as Kreutz sun grazers. And this was to see how probable Eisen's survival as it swings around the sun would be compared to these other comets. Now it's fair to say that the Kreutz comets are slightly different beasts because as the authors of the paper say, Kreutz comets have made at least several sun grazing orbits over the last few thousand years and there are expected to be differences in the outer layers of these new comets as compared to returning comets due to the former's long residence in the Oort cloud. But nevertheless, we're looking for good news on Eisen, so we'll happily play along here. And Knight and Walsh, using the Hubble data, put the size of Eisen at between half a kilometre and two kilometres in diameter, which, comparing it with the Kreutz comet, suggests Eisen is large enough to survive mass loss, as the comet's water and CO2, its volatiles, turn into gas in the sun's glare, a process known as sublimation. Also, having a larger perihelion, or closest distance to the sun than the Kreutz comets, it should sublimate less anyway. So they then investigated tidal disruption as the other possible killjoy eventuality for us eager Eisen spotters. And as luck would have it, the authors feel that Eisen will likely survive being ripped apart as it swings around the sun too, stating in conclusion, Eisen appears likely to survive the combination of mass loss due to sublimation and tidal disruption for most plausible scenarios. So while comets are notoriously unpredictable, and this is by no means the last word, there's at least some positive news to finish on, and we might yet get that comet of the century in early December this year. And even if it's not as great as predicted, it's still going to be worth getting out there and looking. I I think many people were disappointed by Panstars earlier this year, which I think was a shame. Yeah, if you listen to many predictions, including ours, I have to say, it was probably going to disappoint. But it's not often you get naked eye or binocular comets in the sky. So we can't not get a bit excited and optimistic. Thank you, Ralph. And now coming up, we have this month's five-minute concept. And following on from last month's look at nuclear synthesis, we look at the death of stars. This is Awesome Astronomy. In some ways, it's an oddly depressing and stark fact. Every star you can see, and all the ones that you can't, will someday die. Something so beautiful, so permanent, something so affecting on human culture and history is just as transitory and limited as anything else we can see about us. Constellations we have told stories about for millennia will not just change due to the motion of stars, but will utterly vanish as every single point of light so carefully catalogued and measured by generations of astronomers is extinguished. But it's this very fact that makes life on Earth possible, and without the process of star death, we would not be able to gaze for the fleeting moments we have in cosmic history upon Orion or Hercules. Our sun is middle-aged and currently a stable main sequence star, crushing hydrogen into helium in its core, and as we talked about last month, releasing energy from this process that we feel as light and heat. But the sun will one day enter old age and begin processes that will both destroy life on Earth and eventually itself. 
It probably occurred to you to ask what happens when the hydrogen runs out. What happens when the sun runs out of fuel? This is where the sun begins a journey away from the main sequence and towards a swollen, variable future and the beautiful demise that is a planetary nebula. The sun is currently working away at the bottom of the list of 92 natural elements. Every second, over 600 million tonnes of hydrogen, the simplest element, is fused in the core of the sun into the next on Mendeleev's famous list, helium. Like plankton working away at the bottom of the food chain, this start of the nuclear synthesis chain is the easiest but the most essential. Without this step, stars don't shine, energy isn't released, and the universe would be mainly dark, cold hydrogen. Our sun will not go far down the list of elements in its later life. It will start to burn helium as gravity crushes down harder on the core, raising internal temperatures. At the same time, the outer layers of the sun will swell, and the solar system will have at its core a bloated giant, struggling to use the fuel it has left in an ever-shrinking core, synthesising elements up to oxygen and carbon. Then it will end. Not in a flash or a vast cataclysmic explosion, but it will just let go. When you look at a planetary nebula, that is what spectroscopy tells us those pretty clouds are made of. The ring nebula, the dumbbell nebula, the cat's eye nebula. Carbon, oxygen, helium, hydrogen, all drifting into space, leaving the fading ember of a white dwarf. An ember that will cool over a lifetime far, far longer than that of the star that produced it. But is the stars much larger than the sun that we must turn to and thank for our existence? It is in these vast gravity-crushing furnaces that elements heavier than carbon are formed, and nuclear synthesis taken to its periodic conclusion. As a massive star, burning at a faster rate with a hotter temperature exhausts its supply of hydrogen, it switches to helium burning, like the sun swelling and pulsating. Gravity and radiation pressure fighting for supremacy, occasionally hydrogen higher up in the layers of the star is burned. As helium runs out, the gravity pulls harder, winning the battle over radiation. Pressure goes up, temperature increases, and element after element is formed in succession, and a layer of the previous left behind as the core shrinks away. Helium to carbon and oxygen, carbon to magnesium and sodium and neon, silicon, sulphur, layer upon layer of elements that make up much of what you see around you is left as the core becomes heavier and smaller and hotter and more pressurised until we get to the last day. It seems strange to talk about a star on its last day. Something that's had a life of millions or billions of years surely shouldn't have a point we can call its last day. Helium burning lasted millions of years, carbon burning about 600 years, but now a supergiant star ends in an event that for once happens on a timescale we are familiar with, a single day. After all the layers mentioned have been made, the core is at last ready to make the last element it is capable of, atomic number 26, iron. It is actually more accurate to talk about the iron group, including chromium, manganese, cobalt and nickel, but predominantly we are talking about iron. In a single day, the star initiates silicon burning and begins to create iron. The moment this happens, the star has hours left. The core becomes heavier and begins to collapse further. Temperature and pressure, of course, increase, but now there is nowhere to go. It isn't high enough to create further elements. There is no energy release to fight the gravity. The collapse accelerates. Electrons become what is known as degenerate and attempt to fight back. But it doesn't last. Degeneracy pressure cannot support an iron core once it passes a certain mass, and the core collapse continues. The temperature reaches 10 billion Kelvin. The iron begins to photo disintegrate, but the energy released is absorbed. The core collapse reaches supersonic speeds. Temperature reaches a trillion degrees. The density is now that of an atom. Then it stops. The pressure applied by neutrons suddenly stops the core collapse, and it is sudden. So sudden that the layers above the core hit it at speeds of up to 70,000 kilometers a second. The layers rebound, forming a shock front. The layers above are blasted away and heated to incredible temperatures, initiating nuclear reactions and enormous numbers of neutrinos released, which carry away 99% of the energy. And we are left with a stellar remnant, a neutron star. In short, the star explodes in a supernova, becoming so luminous its death is witnessed for the next few million years across the cosmos. If you're wearing jewellery made of a precious metal, look at it. Much of what you're looking at was formed in that moment of star death which is why it's so rare. A star far from here, billions of years ago, made that metal in seconds on a single day. The day it died. That is powerful stuff. The notion that every atom we're made of, every atom that makes up asteroids, planets and skyscrapers, mm. was made in a star or in a star's death throes and then seeded out in space when the star dies. It's a concept that never ceases to be magnificent and bewildering. It, it is just astounding, isn't it, that the iron in your blood... Um, the carbon that makes up your body, you know, the calcium in your bones, that was all formed in stars. 
Yeah. And it's just incredible. And the only it? thing that wasn't is the hydrogen and trace elements that were formed in the Big Bang right at the very right beginning. Right at the beginning, exactly. And that's locked up in water and things like that. But the oxygen that's combined with stars. Amazing stuff. This is Awesome Astronomy. Now, this month, we are joined by astrophysicist Dr. Chris North of Cardiff University. Chris has worked on both the Planck and Herschel Space Telescope projects, has written and contributed to papers on the cosmic microwave background radiation, is heavily involved in astronomy and outreach programs across the UK, is part of the team that's responsible for the fantastic Chromoscope website, and, of course, is well known in the UK as one of the faces of BBC's Sky at Night program. Hello, Chris, and welcome to Awesome Astronomy. Hi, thanks for for having me on. Brilliant. So, Chris, can you tell our listeners what is the cosmic microwave background and what your work in this area has involved? So, the cosmic microwave background is, uh, simply put, the afterglow of the Big Bang. It's it's light that's travelling from such vast reaches across the universe that that light has taken 13.8 billion years to travel from, from where those distant reaches were that it left to get to our telescopes today. And that means that it's taken so long to get here, we're seeing... Uh, what the bits the bits of the universe it left as they were 13.8 billion years ago and that's just after the the universe began in fact we're seeing the universe as it was just a few hundred thousand years after the big bang we can't actually see it any earlier in its history because uh, the the early universe the earlier universe in its first tiny fra- or the first few hundred thousand years was actually opaque it was so hot and dense it was something called a plasma like the surface of the sun you can't see through the surface of the sun it was a uh, this opaque uh, mess of hydrogen and helium uh, ions uh, buzzing around. Light light couldn't really really travel properly. But we can see this cosmic microwave background now as the afterglow of the Big Bang, a sort of baby picture of the universe. And, and we see a few things that are notable about it. One is that it, it seems to be pretty much the same everywhere on the sky. So that says that on these enormous scales that we're looking at, because we're looking at the distant regions of the universe, we're looking at things that are a long way away in every direction on the sky. This thing is basically the same everywhere. So the, the early universe was the same everywhere, except only almost the same. There are tiny variations in the temperature and density of the early universe. We see that as you often see a map of the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB for short, uh, as, as sort of a red and blue blobby map. And, and those red and blue bits are, are patches of the universe that were hotter or cooler. Uh, and that's because little bits of the universe were slightly denser or slightly less dense. And those dense bits were what forms the galaxies and clusters of galaxies that we see around us today, albeit in these very distant reaches of the universe. They, those bits we see there are not responsible for our galaxy. But we can study this light and it tells us a number of really useful things uh, about the universe. What, one is that the early universe is very simple. Uh, in terms of its physics. It's much more simple than a galaxy with stars and gas and dust and things colliding and, and a whole mess of physics that you have to put into simulating that or a solar system or whatever. Because everything was the same everywhere, pretty much, you can do very simple uh, analysis. And you can learn a lot about the early universe. So we can learn, for example, the universe is 13.8 billion years old, plus or minus, there's a little uncertainty, but that uncertainty is 50 million years thanks to the latest measurements from the Planck satellite, which is quite a remarkable level of accuracy for such a big number. Yeah, I mean, how accurate can we make the readings of the CMB? Well, so the, the, the temperature of the microwave background, uh, on average, over the sky, is uh, it's about minus 270 degrees C, if we, if we mapped its, its temperature. And the little variations on that are uh, variations of about one part in a hundred thousand. So we're looking at tiny fluctuations in the universe in the, in the temperature of a hundred thousandth uh, of a degree, essentially. So they're very small variations. <laughs> That's incredibly small. Yeah. Now, now, now Planck is is the the latest satellite to do this. Its its sensitivity at many of its frequencies is something like twenty times better than its predecessor, something called the WMAP satellite. And WMAP did, a, did an amazing job of mapping the whole sky. At microwave wavelengths uh, at sort of what was then unprecedented detail. Planck has gone one better and made essentially the best map possible of the sky uh, at, at, at these wavelengths. Um, and, and and it's hard to see Planck being beaten on that front uh, anytime soon. But what Planck has also done, of course, is as well as answering questions, has, has raised some questions. 
And what might be some of those questions that have been raised by Planck? There's a few things about the early universe that, that we don't fully understand. One is that uh, our current theories say that in the first tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the universe experienced something which we call inflation. Now, well, that seemingly innocuous word is is an expansion of a factor of millions and millions and millions of times in a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. Space itself expanded faster than the speed of light. It was that, that extreme. And we don't really know why. We have a mathematical theories that explain it, and there are a few ideas of what it might have been, but but nothing concrete that says this this is a, a serious candidate for what caused inflation, what made the universe expand. Now, Planck has seen, in by studying those ripples in the early universe, the, the dense bits and the less dense bits, it's seen the signature that possibly inflation is, is real. There are signatures of things that inflationary theory, theories of inflation predict we will see seem to be there, but they, these are hints. These measurements are incredibly difficult to make. But it's also raised some some questions, so, so as well as not answering that question about what inflation is, it's, it's raised questions such as when, when we look at the sky in, say, two different directions, so if you look at one hemisphere of the sky and compare it with the other hemisphere of the sky, if you, if you do that in the right direction, you notice that those two halves of the sky are, are different. And they shouldn't be different. The universe, as far as we're concerned in our cosmological theory, should be the same in every direction. So if you average it over one half of the sky and you average it over the other half of the sky, you should get the same kind of variations. And, and we don't necessarily. Now, there could be a perfectly innocuous answer for this. And lots of people think that there is a perfectly ordinary answer and it'll be something to do with material in our galaxy or in our solar system or, or something that is causing that, that sort of discrepancy between the two halves of the sky. What sort of thing might be causing that? Well, I say that people think it could be something relatively uh, mundane, but, but no one's got a good explanation of what that could be. For example, it can't be simply a, a cloud of dust in one half of the sky that's not in the other half of the sky. It seems to roughly almost kind of align with the plane of our solar system, but not really very well. The fact that it almost aligns is a good indication that there's maybe something going on in our solar system, but... There's nothing we can think of in our solar system that that looks like uh, that that would cause this this effect. So so even if it's something mundane, something very local in the universe, we, we don't know what that what that might be. The, the the cosmological possibilities are that this could be a hint that on very very large scales, larger scales than we can see directly. So we're talking tens and tens of billions of light years, that the universe is is not quite what we expect. That maybe. This implies that the universe is is not quite the same everywhere. And our, and our little bubble of the universe that we can see, which is something like 90 billion light years across, then it is all the same. But on larger scales, maybe it's not. And and these are all big ifs. The, these are all the big things that Planck's going to ask. And they're very hard to, to answer. The, the other thing that Planck is doing is it's, it's able to look at something called the polarization of the light. So this is not just the... That light is a wave, and as it comes towards your detector, the wave is going, say, up and down, or it could be going left to right, for example. And and the polarization is what angle that, that wave is going at, or what angle the wave is waving at. And that tells us something about what was going on when that light was emitted. Now, that information can tell us about that first tiny fraction of a second and inflation. There could be signatures in that information, that polarization of the light, that tell us about inflation, but that needs much more analysis than what's been done so far. Yeah, a long way to go then. There, there is a long way to go. There's another release of data. There was a release of data earlier this year uh, in in March, and there's a release of data later, uh, well, so it's next year, so sort of middle of next year-ish. There'll be another release with hopefully all the data. The, the teams that are heavily involved now are really pushing hard to, to get this to work and to, to get the data properly analysed, which is tricky to do because there's a lot of stuff. If you think if we're looking at the distant reach of the universe, there's a lot of stuff between us and the universe, uh, or the us, us and the other side of the universe, rather. So you've got to take into account all of those things, and you've also got to look at, you've got to know, understand the instrument and the satellite very, very well uh, to, to understand this. So there's an awful lot of work in, in doing that. Brilliant. So you've also worked on the Herschel Space Telescope, I believe, and, and Cardiff University played a leading role in one of the major instruments. Could you tell us a little bit about that work and the instrument Cardiff provided? Yeah, so, so Herschel was sort of a kind of a sister mission to Planck. So Herschel was, was launched at the same time, on the same rocket, in fact, um, back in May 2009. And Herschel is slightly different to Planck. Herschel is what you might call a standard observatory. 
um, where people apply for time on it. Or I say I say they do. They did the the, the spacecraft ran out of its coolants, its helium coolant that kept its instruments cool um, earlier this year and, and is now turned off and, and defunct, um, as was always expected. That's, that's not unexpected at all. Now, on, on board Herschel were three instruments. And one of those instruments was called Spire, an instrument led or developed and, and designed and built and, and operated by an international team led by um, uh, one of the professors in Cardiff, uh, Professor Matt Griffin, um, and, and it's certainly a UK-led instrument so it's great that we've got that involvement in the uk behind what was an incredibly successful instrument that, that matched all its its expectations met all its goals met all its requirements of, of what it was going to do and the data that's come out of, of spire and the other two instruments on herschel is simply exquisite yes i mean even just looking at the pictures they've just been incredible from herschel yeah so, so herschel herschel doesn't see stars herschel sees gas and dust between the stars and those those clouds, those wispy clouds of gas and dust sort of stretching like tendrils through the galaxy on, on massive scales and also on tiny scales. Uh, they're sort of awe-inspiring images. They are, you know, they're, they, they almost look artistic. They look like paintings sometimes. They're absolutely gorgeous to look at. And there's an, a wealth of, a huge wealth of, of information uh, in there. So, for example, that can tell us how stars are forming in our galaxy. And we can look at distant galaxies and see how those are forming uh, and, and so on. And how long do you think the data from Herschel will keep astronomers working? Well, the, the, the data from Herschel is going to keep us uh, busy, keep astronomers busy for certainly for, for years, just to get the data, all the data sort of finally analysed and put in the, the nice sort of accessible database that can be used by astronomers of the future. But will be used then by astronomers of the future for decades is the expectation. So this is all fantastic research with a large British content. As a scientist working in astronomy, what have you made of the recent budget cutbacks and, and what this means for the future of astronomy research in the UK? Well, there have been a few sets of cutbacks, unfortunately. There was one a few years ago, and that was that was a big shock to the, the system, the collective system. But there's also, of course, been cuts nationwide, worldwide almost, uh, due to the financial crisis, and that's had a knock-on effect. Now... You can cut uh, instruments and facilities and so on, but you need the people trained to do it. So one of the problems is that if you if you cut the next generation of uh, instrument designed to look at a certain you know in a certain wavelength, such as microwave light, then that that expertise in the UK disappears. And so even if in ten years time funding comes back, we suddenly don't have the people here in the UK. Now of course science is an international endeavor so other people can come in but you need that kernel you need that core of people to sort of start things going to make the uk a leading role the cuts have meant unfortunately that we're we're perhaps not taking as much as a leading role in future instruments um so are there any examples of of instruments where the cutbacks have hit uh, where we would have been taking a leading role in this i think uh, uh, we we have a role in a, uh, a future instrument, which is actually a sort of a successor to Herschel. Uh, it's a, a mission called Spiker. And, and I think if, if funding had been different, we might have had a more significant role in that mission. We still have involvement in lots of things, but we're may, maybe not at the, as much at the heart of it as we might be. And then even, even with ground-based telescopes, we're, we're pulling out of some of the, the ground-based telescopes, such as the the James Clark Maxwell Telescope and the, and the UK Infrared Telescope, which is a real shame. I mean, yeah, yeah, that, that's been a fantastic telescope. Yeah, the UK Infrared Telescope is is has been immensely uh, useful in in studying the sky at those those near infrared wavelengths. And then the uh, the the JCMT, the, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, is uh, has had recently in the last year or two had a, a new instrument put on there called called Scuba Two, which is looking at slightly longer wavelengths than Herschel. At J the JCMT has a 15-meter diameter mirror. It's much bigger than Herschel. It's about four times the diameter. And so that's able to to study some of these regions in immense detail. And to think that we're not going to then, in a, in a year or two, be be at the core of that, that instrument and that, that sort of investigation is is, uh, is rather rather sad. And and th these things, are, there's, there's a lot to be, uh, there's a lot of debate about you know what what should be cut and what shouldn't be cut and and these are the two that have fallen foul unfortunately but uh those those are the ones that are currently going to probably be bought out by other 
countries. So, so those telescopes aren't actually going to uh, be mothballed and sort of drop out of use. They are actually going to be uh, be used again. Well, a lot of there was a risk of of them being mothballed, but I mean, the cost of doing that. They, these are two telescopes that are based in Hawaii, and one of the interesting things about Hawaii is that the deal with the native inhabitants of Hawaii, um, to whom the the mountain Mauna Kea is a sacred area, um, if you remove a telescope, you have to put it back at its in, in original status. Now, that's obviously very expensive. Right. So beyond your research, you're, you've been part of the team that created the Chromoscope um, website. So for listeners who haven't visited, um, could you describe what it is and why they should visit the site? <laughs> well, well, Chromoscope is a, is a site we developed that lets you look at the sky at multiple wavelengths. So when you first go there, you see the sky at visible wavelengths, as you see with a sort of normal telescope on the ground. It's, it's the whole sky. It's lots of images stitched together from, from a ground-based telescope in that instance. But what you can do is you can pan around the sky, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, and then you can change, you can smoothly fade between wavelengths. Now, we developed this actually for an exhibit uh, in 2009 at the Royal Society, an exhibit all about Herschel and Planck. These, these two instruments are looking at wavelengths that are not visible light, so to try and explain this, we wanted this interface. And we, we made it live. It was developed by myself, uh, Rob Simpson and, and Stuart Lowe. And uh, it's now this, this web app, and, and it was immensely popular. It, we initially hosted it on a server in, I, I, if I recall, it was a server in Manchester, which then uh, essentially died because there was too much traffic to it. So we had to, we had to sort of find another way of hosting it, which we, which we did, and, and it stayed being very popular. And, and uh, I'm not surprised there was so much traffic. I mean, it's a really incredible site to look at. Yeah, it's 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 it. This we still find things on there, you know. As you as you browse around, you explore the sky, looking for something, trying to remind yourself where it was in the sky, or, or trying to see what it looks like at different wavelengths. That suddenly that you find something new. You find an object in, in X rays that you didn't think. So it's all sorts of wavelengths. It's gamma rays, X rays, various infrared wavelengths, visible light, radio waves, uh, microwave light. All these all these wavelengths that are that are there, and uh, and and it's yeah, it's great fun just to to play around with. Um, I, I developed a, a Planck specific version to look at all the Planck wavelengths, which is called a somewhat unimaginatively Planckoscope. <laughs> um, uh, so that's available as well. And that was that was sort of quite quite good fun. And again, so for a similar kind of exhibit, actually, we, we developed uh, we developed that. And and these are all things that I think are used by by schools because uh, it's useful it's useful for for students to understand the the relationship between the different wavelengths. Um, and then also obviously by, by people browsing around and there's various ways you can link it to, to other things to display sets of results and so on. So I know various groups have been using it in, in their, um, not only their own public outreach, but also their research, which is great. So finally, we ask all our guests what discovery in astronomy you would like to have made or would like to make and why? <laughs> um, oh, that's, a, a t- that, that's quite a tough one. So I guess... My my thing that I'd like to know about the universe is, and 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 astronomy is probably not related to anything that I particularly research. But I'd I'd really like to know sort of how our solar system formed and came to be the way it is. So the solar system is very different to other solar systems, and and just understanding why that is is something that that fascinates me. In in some respects, the weirdness of our solar system, I guess, sort of sort of bothers me. <laughs> so so is it unique well hopefully not that would be uh it's pro well probably not because there's a lot of solar systems out there but but maybe the combination of weird things in our solar system uh, such as the earth having a large moon and all these kind of things is the combination of all of those together maybe that makes it unique but um or almost unique um but but just understanding how common that kind of thing is and would be would be fascinating so that, that's something that i really look forward to seeing and wh- whether or not i i'm able to help contribute to that <laughs> who knows <laughs> dr chris north thank you for your time um and you can see chris each month on the bbc sky at night program and urge you all to visit the chromoscope at www.chromoscope.net cheers paul excellent this is awesome astronomy
And the CMB is another one of those mind-blowing ideas, isn't it? Yeah, it's probably the most important scientific discovery of the later half of the 20th century, and it's really up there with the great discoveries of all time. Yeah, and don't forget, it was predicted long before it was found, and when it was, it was found by accident. Well, yeah, some of the best science is done by accident. Look at penicillin. Or Viagra. Shh, that was, that was in confidence, Ralph. This is awesome astronomy. Right then, Earth Dwellers, it's time for the part of the show where you become masters of the universe and pose your questions. We've got lots to pack in, so we'll get right down to business with a question which has to be one of my favourites so far on Awesome Astronomy. Dave Woodford in Scotland asks, could you walk on a brown dwarf's surface? Ralph? Yeah, this is a brilliant question. I don't think we've even mentioned brown dwarfs before on this show, but they always spark off debate. Even we don't agree on how they should be classified. No, no. But I'll give you the facts with a generous servant of opinion too. So what is a brown dwarf? Well, put simply, they're low-mass stars that occupy the region from gas giant planets to red dwarf stars. And they were only confirmed by Discovery as recently as 1995. Because of their low mass and luminosity, they're very difficult to spot. And the reason for that is that they're not stars, they're giant gas giant planets. No, no, they're not. They're, they're not gas giants, they're low mass stars. Well, I think we can agree that they're balls of concentrated gas that don't have enough mass to sustain fusion reactions in their core. Yeah, all right, yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. And that's the characteristic that forms the basis of main sequence stars and the characteristic of brown dwarfs that's missing. Although the larger brown dwarfs are presumed to have sporadic and short-lived eruptions of deuterium or lithium fusion in their cores, these are more like fizzles and justify their unflattering moniker of failed stars. And the International Astronomical Union's website says, at this time there is no official IAU definition in place or proposed that defines the upper limit for when an object is, for example a planet, or a brown dwarf. This limit is generally thought to be about 13 times more massive than Jupiter, but is subject to discussion. Yeah, and this gets even more tricky when we start observing them around main sequence stars. Will we call them planets around their sun, or will they be viewed as a binary system? Yeah, and this issue will raise its head, because even though they're difficult to spot as they don't let off much visible light, through the use of infrared telescopes we now know there are lots of these dark substellar objects floating around. After NASA's Orbiting Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer Telescope, or WISE, began spotting these drifting objects en masse, it was thought that there may even be more brown dwarfs out there than the stars that we can actually see. After more searching, the WISE team now think there are six times more stars than brown dwarfs, but that's still a hell of a lot. And a lot of astronomy news stories have marvelled at these low temperature stars because of how implausible it sounds. Over the last few years, we've heard about brown dwarfs with surface temperatures similar to boiling water, just 100 degrees centigrade. Then one that was likened to a cup of tea, around 60 degrees. And finally one that was declared to be room temperature, around 22 degrees centigrade. But research just last month from the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics suggests this hunt for ever lower temperatures is flawed, and brown dwarfs range between 121 and 177 degrees Celsius. So still very cool for a star, but that's going to melt your beach sandals rather quickly too. And I realize I barely answered your question yet, Dave, but I want to tell people that don't know about brown dwarfs how these objects are awkward mass accumulations that occupy that ground between gas giant planets and fusion reaction stars. Now, you can't walk on a star because it's mostly gas and the temperatures are going to burn you into the elements that you're comprised of long before you get anywhere near the plasma core where the intense pressures would do much the same. But equally, you couldn't walk on a brown dwarf's smaller cousin, the gas giant planet, either. Now, ignoring the fact that we don't know for certain if Jupiter even has a solid core until the Juno spacecraft reaches it in 2016, the atmosphere of gas giants and brown dwarfs, which show similar cloud bands to Jupiter in the infrared, are so large and dense and have winds travelling at thousands of miles an hour that they'd kill you long before you reached anything like terra firma, if there is a solid ground there at all. And you've not even mentioned the radiation. Yeah, quite. In fact, it'd be just as much fun thinking of all the ways a brown dwarf could kill you as it would to imagine elaborate and ultimately futile ways to protect yourself if you actually tried to walk on one. But... Thanks for that question, Dave. We really enjoy playing around with that one. Mm. OK, now a question from John Masters. Alex Speed and Wendy Clark all rolled into one because they all ask about Saturn's rings, which are possibly the most startling thing you can see in a telescope. I never get tired of the moment someone sees them for the first time. How about you, Ralph? Absolutely. I've never seen anyone who takes their first look at Saturn through a scope not gasp. Those rings produce such a visceral reaction. Mm, mm. But what they were asking was, why aren't they forming a moon? Well... The answer is, they are. 
the, the rings have something like 200 moonlets in them um, and what are known as quasi-stable clumps and clusters of uh, ring particles. But these objects are tiny and a few kilometres across and will never form anything bigger. And this is down to gravitational tidal forces of both Saturn itself and what are known as shepherd moons. Now I'll introduce something called the Roche limit here. Uh, this is the distance from a massive body where the gravity will cause tidal forces that would rip a body apart. So, for instance, if we move the rings further out, then there's a chance they would coalesce into a moon. Conversely, if you look at Io around Jupiter, which is under extreme tidal pressure, if we moved it closer, it would probably come apart and be added to the thin rings around that planet. So Saturn's rings sit along the planet's Roche limit, um, and that prevents the material coming together. Now, Pan is a moon within the rings, orbiting in the Enc gap, and it's a shepherd moon. It's an example of a moon that, because of its inherent tensile strength, can overcome the Roche limit. It then acts as a gravitational body on the rings themselves, helping to keep them in place. It stops them drifting off or falling in, and those moonlets and clumps from becoming any larger. I hope that sort of answers the question. So there are moons within the rings, but you're not going to get anything very big. I mean, now that the, the rings themselves um, that you see in the telescope are 7,000 to 80,000 kilometres above Saturn. And they have a thickness between sort of 10 metres and a, a kilometre. They're mainly ice, um, and the mass of the rings is somewhere sort of 3 to 9 times 10 to the 19 kilograms, which, if they did coalesce, they would form a moon about the size of my mass or Uranus's Miranda. So actually, amazingly, despite how big the rings look, that's not going to form a very big moon. But luckily for us, it's happening on such a small time scale that we do get to see these wonderful rings. And what a sight they oh, are. Oh, yeah, scope. yeah. Actually, something else that I, that I did mention that answer was that the rings are actually probably only going to last about another 100 million years um, as they get worn away by meteors. So if people on Earth do last longer than 100 million years, they're not going to have those wonderful uh, rings to watch. Uh, exactly. And if, if we'd, we'd come about a bit further along down time, we wouldn't have them to see. Oh, but then hopefully by that time, Io will have broken up and, um, oh, yeah, then Jupiter, and formed a yeah. ring around yeah. Jupiter. And one last question for Major Ralph. Uh, the papers want to know whose shirt you wear. Bazinga. Ah. But before we float in the most peculiar way, we've had one of our Earthling slaves working day and night in our cave complex, which, by the way, NASA, is the answer to the methane riddle. So we can announce <laughs> a new website for the show. Yeah, we're pleased to announce the new awesome astronomy website is finally ready to launch. So <laughs> the site's already jam-packed full of astronomy news. We've got observing and astrophotography tutorials, various methods to watch or listen to the show, and it's now the new home of your astronomer's den blog. That's right, yep. But we've also got major plans for so much more astronomy content and help to come. Yes, over the coming weeks and months we'll be releasing an absolute galaxy of new content and features including blogs, video tutorials, more ways for you to get involved or contribute and a step-by-step -step guide on how to make your own heat ray. You sure that's a good idea? Yeah, good point. Might remove that one. So go and take a look at www.awesomeastronomy.com and let us know what you think. Are you looking at it yet? Go and take a look. What are we waiting for? Come on. And if you live in the UK or know how to make your IP address look like you're in the UK, <laughs> um, don't forget to watch us on this month's Sky at Night. Also, we're delighted to say that my Sky Guide and the whole Awesome Astronomy show is now played on 365 Days of Astronomy, which you can also find on iTunes. And if you like Awesome Astronomy, do please consider giving us a review on iTunes as it helps us spread the astronomy word to wider audiences. So until next month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins and Paul Hill and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Soulsman. For more information about this podcast, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. You can join in the astronomy discussion on our Facebook group and you can follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us via Facebook, Twitter, or by email at awesomeastropod at gmail.com. We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. It probably occurred to you to ask what happens when the hydrogen runs out. 
What happens when the sun's... F- this is very cheery, isn't it? It's very cheery, isn't it? <laughs> do, 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 do. And then the sun explodes. <laughs> <laughs> just the as, sun just as a... Karen and Dave are walking down the beach. Do, do. <laughs> the sun was a very ordinary main sequence yeah. star, and one day it's fuel exhausted. Do, 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 do. I'm loving this. This is yeah. fantastic stuff. This is the funeral edition. Yeah. 